This podcast is made possible by Avalara and Ledge. Hi, this is Elaine Sun, COO and CFO of Mammoth Biosciences, and you are listening to the CFO Thought Leader Podcast. This is episode 992. You know, the current uh, landscape, as I look at it, is still very uncertain from a macro perspective. There are, there are a lot of uh, geopolitical things in play this year. 40 plus global elections. I think interest rates are still high. Inflation is still high. So I think for me, uh, it's more about how do you prepare for different scenarios, right? So do a lot of scenario planning, optimize our resource allocation, and, and maintain flexible, uh, you know, financial flexibility, right? And I think, you know, obviously the focus is all on growth, but it has to be responsible. So I think it's going to be uh, how nimble you are and how agile you are in terms of making decisions and course correcting uh, over the next 12 months. Hi, it's Jack. On today's episode, we speak with Udit Tipperall, CFO of Anomaly. Kicking off his career fresh out of school, Udit Tipperall joined the audit practice of PricewaterhouseCoopers in New Delhi, where he set about learning the intricate workings of financial compliance. However, an ambition to broaden his horizon led him to move overseas to the U.S., where he landed first in New York City. The shift from New Delhi's familiar chaos to New York's dynamic hustle coincided with a widening of Tipperall's finance lens. It was here, amidst the skyscrapers, that he began to embrace the complexity high-tech companies thrive on, along with their menu of transactions, including IPOs, mergers, and acquisitions. You'll hear that story and much more on today's episode. We'll begin after this. This episode is presented by Avalair Ah. That's the sound of not worrying about sales tax compliance. Because when you automate it with Avalara, you don't have to worry about collecting sales tax or tracking who and what is tax exempt. With Avalara, you don't even have to worry about new tax laws and regulations. Avalara does it for you. If your business sells internationally, Avalara has you covered with cross-border tax compliance solutions. And when it comes time to file tax returns, Avalara automatically takes care of that too, giving you one less thing to worry about. Avalara has managed billions of sales for small, mid-size, and enterprise businesses and seamlessly works with your current sales, e-commerce, and accounting platforms. Take the worry out of tax compliance with Avalara. Ah. Learn more at avalara.com. That's A-V-A-L-A-R-A dot com. Hello, we're speaking to Udit Tabral, CFO of Anomaly. Udit, welcome. Thank you, Jack. Ple- pleasure is all mine. So, Udit, as always, we're going to ask you to look back. And we're looking for those types of experiences that you feel best prepared you to become a finance leader. What would those be? Yeah, absolutely. You know, my journey in finance has been an amazing and uh, fulfilling ride. Uh, it's been spanning over almost two and a half decades now and risking me through a variety of roles and responsibilities. Uh, so fresh out of school, I had the privilege of entering the world of audit and insurance at the big four. Um, and this was back at PricewaterhouseCoopers. And you can call it, that was my first mentor. It was like a boot camp that molded me into the finance professional I am today, right? Um, I started my career back in uh, PwC's India office. So I grew up in India, in New Delhi, and that's kind of where I started the journey. And then I got the opportunity to do a secondment and came to the U.S. uh, in New York City. And this was, you know, I was in my very early 20s. So um, I still remember that day when I came to Penn Station and was a complete chaos trying to find my way, getting to Madison Square Garden, uh, you know, and then the offices used to be out across from the Radio City Hall. So uh, amazing experience. Um, 
spent about two years in New York and then I eventually landed in the Bay Area in San Jose. And that's where I got my, uh, you know, doctorate into what I would call the technology space. Um, but, you know, having to be in three different offices gave me a global approach into the world of finance. And it's been so rewarding. So uh, just to elaborate a bit more on my uh, PwC tenure, you know, during my time at PwC, you know, I very quickly excelled at navigating the intricate world of technology companies and tackled complex matters like IPOs, M&As, divestitures, and SEC matters. Uh, it was unraveling a puzzle, right? Uh, but I thrived on the challenge. I led teams, built relationships with uh, the executive teams and audit committees and became intimately familiar with the intricate dance of financial landscape. But you know, as they say, the best view comes after the hardest climb. And that's when I relished my time. And when I relished my time at PwC, I did, I felt the tug to be on the other side, uh, leading a finance organization myself. Before we uh, jump to industry, I wanted to ask you about your experience at PwC because you moved around the globe with them. And I'm wondering if, you know, was it simply you raising your hand, letting them know that, you know, you wanted to experience uh, professional life in different geographies or what? Help us understand how you did that. Yeah, no, I think that uh, it's a great question, right? And when you're at firms like PwC, uh, where you do have the opportunity to take up global roles, and I was very fascinated by that, right? So when I uh, you know, I had colleagues who had made that move, who had uh, made those transfers. Uh, so definitely it was a leap of faith, I would say. You know, it's not very easy to move countries when you're such uh, at a young age. Uh, it's uh, like stepping out of your comfort zone and trying something new. But that's the thrill and excitement, right? Uh, I, I really wanted to experience how it was. And especially when you're going uh, with, uh, with, with the firm and, you know, you're taken care of, uh, meaning it's not like, You've got a support system. You've got mentors and all. So my uh, objective was never to go to the U.S. and settle there, right? So when I made that transition uh, to New York, uh, the goal was to come back. It was a, supposed to be a short-term stint, and I did come back for a few months. And then I got a call back and said, uh, if you, if I'd be interested to take a a role, and they would sponsor my, you know, visa and my sponsorship for my uh, green card, right? Which is so important. So that's, you know, again, uh, I think it's, it's every individual is different, but I always had that. Um, Did you know that possibility that that call was likely to come or was it a surprise to you when it came? No, it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't expected. Uh, so I came to New York in 2001 and, you know, 9-11 happened. So uh, there was, uh, you know, and, you know, we had just come out of a recession and, uh, you know, uh, from a dot-com bust, if you will. And you know, firms were still laying off people. So, you know, there was no expectation that I would get a call. Wow. Some real uncertainty at that time. Forgive me uh, for interrupting. Uh, tell us about your, your post PwC chapter that you opened. So I took the plunge into the industry and earned a role at Trimble Navigation. It was a major player in the tech realm uh, with over a billion in revenue. And I was responsible for a lot of M&A that the company used to do. They used to do three to four acquisitions every quarter. And my job was to basically identify, you know, what those companies were, do the due diligence, and then eventually integrate those companies uh, into what I would call the business units. And I got to work with a lot of the uh, business unit uh, GMs, general managers, and help them understand how software businesses used to work. That was still very nascent at that point. Uh, it, I'm talking about, uh, you know, 2005, 2006. Um, and um, I got to see uh, the rewards of growing as a professional, uh, but I also got to see the world. So, you know, there was a lot of these acquisitions were in Europe um, and I was doing this all by myself uh, with consultants. So it was really, really uh, amazing. And then from Trimble, uh, I joined a company called Service Source which was in the process of going public. Uh, and I saw, oversaw a significant IPO, a secondary offering. We did a convertible debt offering. So it was uh, exhilarating to witness the company's transition from going private to public. Um, and again, I had the opportunity to spearhead the streamlining of operations and fortifying the compliance framework, guiding the FPN and IR, IR teams through earnings releases and analyst conversations 
was was a highlight of my time there right so i spent about 5 years over there um and uh, then embarked on uh, then came back to the private company world where i joined a company called sidecore uh, where i was svp of finance uh, and the best way for me to describe sidecore is you know picture this like a company racing forward at breakneck speed but with financial systems barely hanging on right so and that's not unusual uh, when you go to private companies a lot of times the uh, back office is under invested uh, even though the company is experiencing rapid growth so for me it was like uh, laying the tracks uh, as the speeding train was coming right so it was like you couldn't do it fast enough and the 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 company was based out of denmark so headquartered in denmark so i had to make 40 trips across the pond convert the financials from what i would call danish gap to to us gap and ifrs Uh, we had to get the company ready for an ipo um which we did in record time and and this is a company that used to close its books on a piece of napkin so coming from uh you know that and growing a team from like a couple of individuals to a team of 40 people that i was leading over there and then we got to a very successful outcome uh, by selling the company and i stayed on with uh, with the new investors for for a few years i wanted to uh ask about that transition though to uh Trimble Networks where i think you described you know you'd be operating off and by yourself and and collaborating with these consultants just such a different uh world than what you had at PwC where there were other uh perhaps mentors you could reach out to or could you could you maybe i i i imagine that was a challenging transition for you am i right or how would you you know characterize that adjustment yeah you know i think when you're at the firm uh, you do get to experience different uh, client environments so you're working you know uh, with uh, private companies you're working with large public companies and a lot of times you get to really see firsthand how these companies operate uh, even though you might not be part of that company right so that does prepare you so when you make that transition it makes it a little easier but obviously it's a very different world you go from a consulting a client service organization to uh, to being a part of the company so it's like a lot of times when you are in the audit world or the assurance world uh, your answer uh, is okay you know it's more a compliance driven answer but then when you become part of the company you have to take a more consultative approach and you're now there to solve the problem not tell them what the problem is but you're part of the solution right so that was the biggest i would say uh, change for me is like how do i adapt myself wherein i am now part of the solution and trying to um, make sure that um, you know i am actually helping the company get to its vision to its objectives um, and and i think that's probably the biggest adjustment in my mind i think a, a lot of these larger companies have a lot of former big four people in them so obviously there's Uh, a lot of sh- uh, storytelling and sharing experiences in terms of how they made that transition uh, that also helped were there times where you felt you needed to broaden yourself and and not be cast as simply a chief accounting officer but someone involved in the operations involved in fpna you know the strategic thinker was there times during your career where you felt you had to push back or open doors for yourself to make certain you didn't get typecast it like that yeah absolutely i, I think you know uh, if you look at a novel cfo journey uh, the way i look at it is there are three tracks you can become a cfo you either come up through the accounting ranks and and that used to be more common i would say in large industrial manufacturing companies you know the cfo was seen as a even in a lot of cases seen as a successor for the ceo and you know it came through the uh, controllership rank i think more recently it's more like if you have to have the fpna track or the ir track to become a cfo right and i had the same uh, i would say um, questions that were asked when i was trying to i for the cfo spot as hey you don't check the box on fpna or you don't check the box on ir right so i had to make sure that as i was developing myself along this journey i got the experience to work on fpna and that's kind of happened uh, back at service source uh, where uh you know i got some ir experience being a public company i used to help the cfo with earning scripts and analyst questions and then when i went to uh sidecore i made sure that i actually had some fpna responsibilities so i was overseeing that aspect as well 
But I, I agree with you 100% is, you know, just, you know, with, with the accounting, you get uh, tagged as uh, uh, an accountant and it m- makes it harder uh, to, to take up a, a broader role as a CFO. And um, but my, my belief is that, you know, uh, you know, when you're in the controllership organization, um, you get very strong on the uh, on the balance sheet aspects, the cash flow aspects, which you might not have the uh, luxury of doing when you're just running FPN because that's very PNL focused. So it gave me a well-rounded uh, background to become a CFO with uh, with an accounting foundation uh, and then enriched by FPN and IR. One of the questions, Udit, that we like to ask our CFO guests is. Do you recall a time when a, the CFO tapped you on the shoulder and perhaps asked you to step into a meeting and maybe it was the the day before or maybe he let you know on Monday that there was going to be a, a board meeting on Thursday, whether it was a board meeting or just a senior management meeting where he wanted you there to answer questions or possibly present. And it was the first time really that you had this very senior level and here was the the CFO or whoever it might have been your boss telling you I want you there we're going to need you uh is that something you can relate to or is there a story in your past like that yeah i think i think uh it uh you know absolutely i think uh it's happened uh, you know i can't remember a, a particular incident but you know i've been asked to uh sh- participate in meetings either with the, the exec team or even at the board level, um, which, you know, I was not expecting to be a part of, right? Um, and I think uh, for me, that has not been a challenge, I would say, because again, I, I reflect back on my PwC days where it was very common for me to go in front of audit committees and, and give presentations. Uh, so that prepared me for um, public speaking as well as boardroom conversations. Um, and, you know, if you know your subject matter, right, which is typically if a CFO comes to you or a C-level exec comes to you to take you in a meeting, that's because they don't have all the answers sometimes and they want to make sure that they have the right audience in the room. Um, so, yeah, I, I think, you know, there's been plenty of such occasions, but I never had, you know, I, I saw those as opportunities to uh, to get visibility in front of uh, the board, right, or, or the or the e-staff. But Based on the roles I've been at, I think it wasn't an issue for me. Tell us about entering the CFO office uh, for the first time. How did you uh, How did you open that chapter? I joined a company called Secure Auth as the CFO, uh, and then followed on by Arcos. And in both these companies, I orchestrated global financial operations and made strategic decisions, shaping the financial future of those companies. Um, partnered very closely with, you know, the investors, the board, uh, the executive team. And that was my kind of uh, first foray into the C-suite. Um, and here I am today at Anomaly, right? Um, here I'm juggling two different roles, one of the chief financial officer and also of the chief op- op- operating officer. And it's been an exhilarating dual role that allows me to shape the financial future while also influencing operations and partnering closely with go-to-market teams to drive growth. But as they say, right, success is not final and failure is not fatal. It's the courage to continue that counts. And, uh, you know, I'm ready to keep forging ahead on this thrilling journey in finance. So when you, you've made different moves, has it been a recruiter uh, that's helped you or is it uh, relationships? H- how would you do it? I, I, you know, I've been very fortunate, Jack. I think most of my uh, opportunities have been through relationships, right? I think, uh, and these are relationships that you forge, not just uh, in in one chapter, but it's a culmination of you know things you've done over your career. So I still have mentors uh, that are from my PwC days, and then I've kept in touch with uh, board members and C-level execs from all the companies I've been at. So the opportunity at Secure Auth was actually. Uh, through through somebody that I'd worked with who had taken a board role, right? And the person called me and said, look, you know, uh, I would, would love to, um, you know, have you interview for this role. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, they had all the confidence in me that I could do it, even though it was the first time CFO role. Um, and then subsequently as well, right? 
the the places I've been at has been through relationships and through networking. Well, thank you for a, a nice overview of your career journey, Udit. Uh, but right now, let's uh, find out about Anomaly. What is this company about? What was the opportunity that you saw and understood? You know, this is this is a place I can I can have impact. What what drew you there? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, so Anomaly is a cybersecurity company. Uh, we are a venture backed company. Uh, uh, it's a series uh, D. Um, I think uh, what we do is uh, at Anomaly, we are revolutionizing how our customers navigate the ever changing landscape of global cyber threats, right? Uh, empowering them to elevate the security operations and fortify their cyber defense capabilities. Uh, we've got an AI-powered security ops platform, uh, which is cloud native, and it's enhanced by an intelligent co-pilot that automates critical tasks, empowers SOC analysts, and provides essential risk insights to organization, ultimately boosting productivity and talent retention. And this is so important in today's day and age. You know, every company talks about AI, and it's become, you know, a kind of a buzzword, if you will. Uh, but I think this is where we truly differentiate because, you know, our customers really uh, become more efficient uh, as they are using our platform and uh, the AI uh, co-pilot along with it. Um, so, you know, I think the way I got interested in Anomaly and that's kind of the, I would say, evaluation or assessment process I go through any time I take a new role is there are three questions I ask myself, right? The first question is, what is the industry that the company operates in, right? Uh, because, you know, you could be the best company uh, in the world, but, uh, you know, if you're in a space that's not growing or uh, th then, you know, you might have the best management team, but it's not going to help you, right? So cyber, uh, you know, my last two roles were at, in cybersecurity and, you know, I, I I understand the landscape of cybersecurity. So that was kind of, um, a, a huge advantage for me. Uh, the other two things I look at is uh, culture of the company, and that's really big because uh, <clears throat> you know you, you know you've got to, when you when you're working at a company, you're spending more time, um, more day hours, uh, you know, working versus what you spend at home. So you want to make sure you you have the right cultural fit uh, and the right values that the company lives with, uh, and then you know the third is the people, which basically comprises of the management team as well as investors. And I think for me, um, joining Anomaly uh, was not was like check the boxes on all those three fronts. Now, I think you mentioned Series D, but uh, could you give us uh, more of the the history, abbreviated history behind the capital structure? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so as I mentioned, right, it's a venture-backed company. Uh, we've got tier one investors like General Catalyst, IVP, and Google Ventures, uh, amongst others. Uh, our founder, who's still with the company, uh, is a very well known in the valley. Uh, he actually was the uh, co-founder of another company called Arcsight, uh, which had gone public and uh, eventually uh, got acquired by HP. And he started Anomaly around 10 years back. Um, uh, so, and then um, I think over about three years back, uh, we hired uh, Ahmad Rubai as a CEO, uh, who's run large public companies in the past. So. Uh, the company, um, as, I, as I would describe from a capital structure perspective, you know, a Series D backed by tier one investors. And uh, we are uh, what I would describe as uh, a mature private company. I wouldn't call us a startup because it's been around for almost a, a decade now. And, um, you know, we are uh, profitable and we are growing. So. And, and roughly what's the, uh, the head count of the workforce? Around, uh, we have about 300 people. 300 people today. What was your first order of business as you arrive and, and what you hope to achieve that first year? Yeah, I think when I when I came in, right, for, for me, uh, the first order of business was to really understand what the company did, right? Understand the, the, the business of the company, talk to uh, the various stakeholders in the business, understand what their priorities were, what is it that they were trying to accomplish and how I could help them in that journey. Uh, I also spend time speaking to customers, to partners, because, you know, you get a lot of valuable insight when you speak to external stakeholders, right? Um, and, and that gave me a, a very good understanding of, you know, what the company does um, and, and where the company was going, right? And then uh, with that, 
knowledge, I also spend a fair bit of time uh, understanding the finance function and also the ops function, which both reported to me. And my initial focus was on gaining a comprehensive understanding of the company's financial processes, the team dynamics, and also the overarching uh, business strategy. And uh, this involved fostering open communication with both the finance team and key stakeholders, uh, which enabled us to uncover our strengths and identify areas right for improvement, right? Um, and then, you know, obviously, um, based on, on those objectives and, and, you know, our, our strategic plan is now how could I come up with a very tactical plan and, you know, both a one year plan and a, and a long term plan to get to uh, our long term vision, right? So, so that was kind of my, um, what I would say, focus for the first uh, 12 months. Is there a metric or some business dynamic that you have sought to raise the profile of since your arrival there? Is there something that you thought a number that needed to be shared more broadly, educated the organization in a, as to why a certain metric needs to uh, be top of mind? Uh, anything like that you could share with us in terms of since your arrival, as you cast your eyes on, on the numbers and understood uh, from your point of view, how the company was performing? Yeah, absolutely. So I think there are a few key metrics or, uh, you know, I, I call them key business dynamics that I look to better uh, expose and measure, right? So the first one is uh, what I describe as customer lifetime value uh, versus customer acquisition cost. And that's to understand the long-term value a customer brings compared to the cost of acquiring them. And that is crucial, uh, especially for a software SaaS business for optimizing our marketing and sales effort. Uh, we we look at uh, you know uh, customer behavior and retention metrics both on a gross retention and re net retention basis uh, to to refine our uh, calculations and ensure a healthy what I would describe a CAC to uh, CLTV ratio. Uh, the other piece that I look at is you know the impact of security posture on revenue generation and that's interesting because you know we are a security company and security is our core offering. And we explore how a strong security posture translates to increase customer acquisition and retention, right? So this goes around, you know, when customers buy our product, right? How are they adopting the solution? How are they getting value out of it? Because that's what makes them sticky. That's what makes them a customer for life. And it's very important that we can quantify the true ROI of our security solutions. Uh, some of the other ones that I look at is the efficiency of sales and marketing funnels. Uh, so, you know, we, we, we refine our sales and marketing funnel metrics to identify areas for improvement. Uh, and this might involve things like tracking different marketing campaigns. Um, uh, and by measuring these dynamics, we can optimize our lead gen and conversion process, uh, driving sales growth, right? And again, this is very typical for software SaaS companies. And finally, um, the other one that I look at, which is, um, employee engagement and productivity, right? Uh, you know, in my mind, a happy and engaged workforce is vital for long-term success. Uh, and we explore metrics like employee satisfaction, you know, turnover rates and productivity indicators to understand the impact of our people uh, on our financial performance. And by fostering a positive work environment and investing in employee development, uh, we can enhance both productivity and overall business health. So th these are some things, you know, again, uh, outside of your normal metrics that every company looks at, which is, you know, ARR growth and uh, EBITDA and free cash flow, right? That's that's kind of a given uh, for any finance organization. But I, I think some of the ones that I just uh, discussed uh, enhances all the other metrics uh, if we were to focus on those. Now, you emphasized uh, that you have a, a C, you play the COO role here as well. Could you help us understand what that title or uh, responsibilities? What are the types of conversations it allows you to have? You know, if I look back at the CFO role, right, it's it's been evolving uh, and as I've seen it in my journey, right? And what I've been experiencing was uh, CFOs are just not, uh, uh, you know, tasked with the financial performance of the company. They're also responsible for making sure that the company gets to those objectives, right? So even in my prior CFO roles, even though I did not formally have the COO title, 
um, I was getting more and more involved in the go-to-market side of the business, you know, get, getting involved in the product decisions in terms of what do we build, what do we buy. Uh, so every strategic uh, element of the business, there's a huge influence that's paid, uh, you know, played by the finance org. And having that title here actually uh, makes it even more natural because now, you know, I'm actually partnering very, very closely with the go-to-market organization, which is both our CRO and CMO, and you know, understanding how do we get to our objectives. It's not just about finance uh, giving the resources or making those resource allocation decisions, but it's also uh, double-clicking in terms of you know how do we solve for those challenges. So you know, like all of the revenue ops reports into me, so I have real-time visibility into uh, you know our funnel, right? In terms of how are we doing in terms of creating leads. What are the marketing initiatives that work in the company? You know, where are we getting uh, demand gen from? Or what are the events uh, or activities we do is for brand awareness? Um, and that makes me, uh, you know, put on my dual hat sometimes CFO in terms of do I make more resource allocations to certain areas which are working better uh, and pull back on the others? So, you know, having that visibility on a real time basis. Um, Make, gives me the confidence to invest in the business, right? The other thing is, you know, I don't have to wait until the results, uh, till the CRO delivers his or her number. I know six months in advance whether do I have enough um, pipeline or do I have enough confidence that we'll get to our number two quarters out. Because uh, for me to run a predictable and repeatable business, uh, it's important that I'm just not focused on the current quarter, but I have a view of what's going to happen in the next six to nine months uh, to run the business, right? I cannot run the business on a one quarter view, right? And for for being in that operation role uh, tells me where things are broken, where I need to go and fix it, uh, which might hurt us in, in, the, in the medium to long term. Well, just to uh, continue uh, regarding that operations role, can you provide any insight for us into how the company's strategy for adopting and integrating AI technologies into its operations. Can you share any insight as to how that's being done or how that was done, this being an AI driven company? Yeah, uh, you know, I can answer that question uh, from, from two uh, aspects. So one is uh, from a customer lens perspective, right? In terms of the solution we provide today and how it's helping our customers. Uh, and, you know, many, uh, you know, uh, customers that I talk to, uh, they basically are struggling because, um, you know, I think the mantra has changed from growth at all costs to grow more responsibly and grow more efficiently. And that has, you know, that applies not just to private companies, it applies to public companies, which means um, every company is struggling to do more with less. And I think in, in that example, you know, AI uh, can be a huge enabler. And what we've heard from our customers is when they use, you know, our solution, it makes their um, cyber analysts more efficient uh, and they can focus on tasks that are more value added tasks versus mundane tasks, right? And the same applies to us as I look at our organization internally, right? There are a lot of repetitive tasks that uh, we can uh, uh, automate using AI. And these, these are things like data entry, reconciliation, you know, basic financial analysis uh, that can free up my team's time for more strategic analysis and partnering with other departments. Uh, you know, the other place where we are using AI internally is around improved customer insights and segmentation. So, you know, our customer success and organization, we are using uh, AI powered uh, CRM tools that uh, are helping us gain deeper insights into our customer behavior and preferences. Uh, and this, you know, for example, uh, just to give you a, a very specific example, right? If, you know, uh, a lot of software companies, they, um, they get a lot of support tickets uh, from, from customers. And uh, uh, a lot of the time that support teams spend is, um, uh, you know, responding to these tickets. Uh, but with the help of AI, now we've been able to go and, uh, uh, categorize those tickets into themes. Okay. So let's say you're seeing that, you know, 20% of the volume uh, of the tickets have a common theme. And then you can understand, okay, uh, you know, how do you solve for that uh, by either 
education or training your customers. Maybe they don't know how to, how to use the product or it could be a product functionality thing that you can work with your R and D teams to enhance. And that just not, you know, that takes care of a lot of the, the velocity of the tickets that come through, right? It's like you're, you're finding the root cause of the problem. So you can actually use AI to do a lot of those things. And, you know, I think it's still very early days, I would say. Uh, I think I, I see there could be, it could be a lot of uh, other areas where we could use AI. And uh, maybe the next interview you're going to have is, 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 is with my AI bot for, for all you know, right? So it, it's, it's scary, uh, but it's obvious, obviously, you know, you've got to be very responsible in terms of how you use AI. You could go in so many directions as we're, as I think you're suggesting. I mean, how do you make certain that uh, the AI initiatives that you're sort of placing bets on are, are the, uh, you know, how do you narrow down what you want to focus on? Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's going back to prioritization in terms of understanding where the team spends most amount of their time and where things uh, could be uh, automated and done in a more efficient manner. Uh, and then tackling that, right? Because uh, again, um, uh, you know, you want to make sure that the results you're getting from AI is also, uh, you're not getting false um, positives or hallucinations and things of that nature. Um, so, you know, you've got to be very careful in terms of how you use AI, uh, especially given the early days. Well, Udit, we're up to our finance strategic moment question, where we ask finance leaders to share with us just one of their many moments of insight that they've experienced during the course of their career. We're looking for a moment of uh, strategic insight that you've experienced. What comes to mind when uh, we ask for a finance strategic moment? Yeah, I think early in my uh, CFO career, right? Um, uh, I was, I was, as I was leading the finance team, um, uh, what I observed was the numbers were, was strong. And this was during a budget review that I was doing. The numbers were strong and uh, growth was steady. Uh, however, there was a nagging uh, feeling persisted. There was a disconnect between what I would describe the financial metrics uh, and the whispers that I he heard in the organization. And that's more on the, on the sales and marketing side, right? Um, so, um, you know, as I said, my, my, what I would describe my aha or finance strategic moment happened during that routine budget review, uh, where, where, I, where I saw that, you know, we were allocating a fair bit of the spend to marketing expenses, uh, and there was skyrocket, skyrocketing, yet our lead generation remained stagnant, right? So I was not really seeing, uh, the, the signs. And, and this, uh, what I would say is triggered a deeper dive, um, and when we did the data analysis, uh, it revealed a very disturbing uh, truth, uh, which was marketing campaigns were very flashy, right? Uh, but they lacked customer focus, right? And uh, it goes back to, you know, um, a, a quote uh, that I remember from uh, Peter Drucker. And he said, like, look, the purpose of a business is to create a customer, right? And we were creating campaigns and we were spending a lot of money, you know, in flashy boots and everything, uh, but not customer relationships. And, you know, sometimes it's very tricky when, when you're trying to solve a problem, right? You've got to do it with data because opinions are uh, very dangerous and you've got to do it with a dose of humility. So what I had to do was, um, I knew that a, a unilateral financial decree wouldn't suffice, right? So, uh, it was time for collaboration. Uh, and I reached out to the go to market teams, the CMO, the CRO, others, uh, fostering a spirit of empathy and open communication, right? Uh, it wasn't, uh, hey, this is finance versus marketing or finance versus sales, uh, but we were a united C-suite um, with a shared mission, and the shared mission was customer satisfaction. So we conducted uh, joint customer interviews. Uh, we heard, held workshops, uh, and the insights were eye-opening, right? Uh, customers felt our marketing didn't resonate with their needs. Uh, we were pushing features, uh, not solutions. Uh, and that ignited our courage to innovate, right? We embarked on a customer-centric marketing transformation. Uh, you know, the other thing that really helped me uh, in this uh, thing, and, you know, it, it is something that I've learned as part of this thing, is you've got to be a cohesive unit with your C-suite. And it has to be a, a nurturing and inclusive environment. Uh, otherwise, it gets very difficult to solve these cross-functional uh, issues. Um, and then marketing shifted focus to understanding customer pain points and crafting targeted messaging. You know, sales and customer uh, joined the table, uh, shared real-time feedback, 
And this cross-functional collaboration uh, led to a pioneer approach to customer acquisition. So obviously we fixed the problem. Uh, the uh, acquisition costs for new customers went down, lead conversion, conversion rates uh, uh, soared, and uh, the customer lifetime value uh, went up, right? But more importantly, what I learned in this process and what was the strategic uh, moment for me was uh, we fostered, you know, a genuine connection with our customers, you know, and, uh, you know, there was uh, this bridge between finance and the other functions, and it promoted uh, kind of a behavior of servant leadership, uh, a, a customer centric mentality, uh, which led to a, a business success. So, you know, that that's kind of, of me, for me, it was very important to kind of uh, learn from that experience. You know the feeling. A report deadline is looming and your team is buried in spreadsheets with tasks like bank and payment processor reconciliations, journal entry prep, and cash flow reporting. But what if there was a better way? Ledge automates the tedious work that slows your team down, like high volume transaction matching, journal entry creation, and even cash flow forecasting. Ledge glues all of your financial data together across your ERP, banks, payment processors, data warehouse, and more, and automates any workflow, no matter how complex or unique to your business. Get real-time cash flow visibility and make cash reporting and forecasting effortless while increasing controls and accuracy. And Ledge requires no IT or R&D resources. Ledge plugs right into your existing stack so you can get set up in just a few hours. Imagine a world where your team can close the books faster with fewer resources. Imagine audit-ready data all year round. With Ledge, you can finally stop scaling headcount just to keep up with growth. Visit ledge.co, that's ledge.co, to learn more about how you can automate your finance operations without the heavy lift. Nice. Thank you for that. We're going to jump to our mentoring round where we'll ask you several quick questions intended to inspire and inform future finance leaders. We want you to think back the first time you actually stepped into a CFO role. And Udit, we're wondering if you could go back in time, what you would tell yourself. There must have been something that first 60 days that surprised you, something uh, you wish you knew was coming your way. Anything? Yeah, looking back on my journey to CFO, uh, I would say here are a few gems that I wish I'd known uh, from the beginning. Uh, the first one is, you know, finance is just one piece of the puzzle, right? So, you know, obviously, uh, financial literacy and fluency is essential to do the job. Uh, but uh, my understanding is that a successful CFO understands the entire business ecosystem, right? Uh, you've got to be curious. You've got to learn the language of different departments. And you've got to build strong relationships across the organization, right? So that's key. The second thing, what I would call is, uh, it's just not about numbers, right? Uh, it's about the story they tell, right? So uh, financial data is a powerful narrative, right, tool. Uh, but learning to translate that data into clear, concise insights uh, that tells you the story, right? Okay, what is that data telling you and what do you, what do you have to go and fix? And the third thing that I would say uh, is you've got to be a champion for the customers because, you know, businesses uh, exist and businesses survive just for one thing, and that's the customer. So every financial decision that uh, the organization makes should be made with the customer mind, customer in mind, right? Uh, their needs and satisfaction are the ultimate drivers for growth. Uh, so those are the three things that uh, I think uh, is, is something that, uh, you know, I, I, I learned on the job, but I wish I knew going into the job. Okay. Well, thank you for that. We uh, always like to ask our guests to reflect a little on the personal side. And uh, I tend to get a little pushy on this one. <laughs> Tell us something about yourself that most people don't know. Yeah, I think I think in the uh, I would say in the fast-paced uh, world of finance, it's very easy to get caught up in the constant stream of numbers and decisions, and it's it's a it's a stressful job. 
Um, so I think for me, uh, you know, what I'd like to typically do uh, to unwind and recharge is uh, find solace in nature, right? Uh, I, I, I head outdoors for long walks. Uh, I like to immerse myself in nature, feeling the fresh air, uh, you know, observing the world around me, which is incredibly uh, grounding. And it allows me to clear. Where is your office? Where is your office? How do you take these long walks? Yeah, and it's hard to do it on, on weekdays. So, you know, uh, we, are, we are in Red City, but I typically do it, you know, especially weekends are, are kind of what I would describe my uh, me time. And, and a lot of times, you know, I, I'm an early bird, so I get up very early in the morning and um, try at least, uh, if, you know, go for, for a walk before I uh, hit my commute. The other thing that I found uh, helpful for me is meditation, right? Um, I found that to be a very powerful tool for de-stressing. And you don't, you don't need like one hour, you don't need to go to a gym. You can even carve out 15 minutes uh, between meetings uh, to do that. Uh, but it helps me to manage stress and cultivate a sense of my inner calm, right? And it might seem counterintuitive for a CFO, but um, you know, but a clear and focused mind is essential for making uh, sound financial decisions. Now, we, we've had quite a few uh, share with us that they've begun meditating. I'm wondering if it's something you did 10 years ago or is this something within the last five years? Uh, I think it, it's been over the last five years, I, I would say. You know, I think it's very difficult to focus when your mind is running in uh, all different directions. Um, and it's, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say I'm there yet. I think it's, I'm, still, uh, I'm still a learner. So, uh, but, but yes. Is it something you began uh, experimenting with during COVID or uh, would that be? Yeah, I would say I think COVID uh, gave me a lot of time to reflect and think. Uh, I also joined some online classes. You know, I was doing some yoga. Um, and as part of that, you know, there was a, a, you know, towards the end of the session, they used to do like 10 minutes of meditation. So it started off in, in short intervals. Uh, and now I have the ability to, you know, focus a little bit more. Um, but it's, it that, that didn't come naturally to me. Let me be very honest with you. So it was, it took, it took a lot of practice to, to get that. What about a book selection for us? Is there anything you'd recommend? It um, doesn't have to be a business book. Perhaps it might be a, a podcast. No, I think podcasts are very good. I think there's one that I uh, listen to. You know, it's, uh, you know, there's, there's a podcast by Frank Slootman uh, at Snowflake. So he's got some really good ones uh, that I've uh, listened to in the past. Yeah, that was uh, in relation to his book. Same title, I think. Amp it up. What, what in particular? And I know he has many insights along the way, but what, what was maybe something that resonated with you? What did you find interesting? It was, you know, very, very interesting in terms of how he described uh, leaders to be either drivers or passengers. In terms of some, some take the initiative and and own it. Some are more in for the right. But there were a lot of good insights in that, so I, I really enjoyed it. Okay. Excellent. Thank you for that. We're going to, uh, it's up to our final question, <laughs> this interview. Uh, so we're going to ask you to look forward. Finally, the next 12 months, we'd like to know what your priorities are as CFO of Anomaly. Yeah, I, I think, you know, the current uh, landscape, uh, you know, as I look at it, uh, is still very uncertain from a macro perspective. There, there are a lot of uh, geopolitical things in play this year with, uh, you know, 40 plus global elections. I think interest rates are still high. Inflation is uh, still high. So I think for me, uh, it's more about how do you prepare for different scenarios, right? So do a lot of scenario planning, optimize our resource allocation and, and maintain flexible, uh, you know, financial flexibility, right? And I think, you know, obviously the focus is all on growth, but it has to be responsible. And, and then the other piece I would say is how do you integrate AI strategically to up-level, you know, things for the future, fostering innovation and prioritizing well being. Um, and, and, you know, so it's, it's like, um, I, as I, I like to say, we're not out of the woods yet. So I think it's going to be uh, how nimble you are and how agile you are in terms of making decisions and course correcting uh, over the next 12 months. Udit Tiberal, thank you for joining us on CFO Thought Leader. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Hello, Thought Leader listeners. We hope 2024 is treating you well. If you haven't already, we hope you'll pay a visit to cfothoughtleader.com 
and go ahead and subscribe to our Mentoring Round newsletter, where we highlight the career lessons and moments of strategic insight shared by our recent CFO guests. Also, LinkedIn users, please go ahead and follow our CFO Thought Leader company page, and you'll be certain not to miss a single Thought Leader video debut. CFO Thought Leader, the number one thought leadership platform exclusively for and by CFOs. As always, thank you for listening.